NTV Wild Talk in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct. Hello and welcome to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi, once again coming to you from the quaint gardens here at Fairmont, the Norfolk in Nairobi. So last week it was about Japan and ivory and today it's about China and this is why. There are an estimated 40,000 to 60,000 Chinese nationals living in Kenya, many of whom have settled here for work purposes. When Kenyans think of the Chinese, what often comes to mind is infrastructure and development, roads and railways, or business and trade. But the Chinese are also very often associated with ivory, and the biggest demand in the world for ivory comes from China. The demand, however, is a spelling doom for the iconic African elephant, whose tusk is used to make ivory ornaments, and for this to happen, the elephants must be poached. The Chinese are oftentimes viewed as one of the biggest reasons for the deaths of the African elephant. While the words conservation and China rarely go hand in hand, one man, 28-year-old Hong Xiang Huang, has over the years been trying to change this. Hong is an ivory trade investigator and the founder of NGO China House, based in Nairobi. Thanks to his efforts and others, Hong says China's attitude towards conservation, particularly of the African elephant, is in fact changing. Remember, you can chime into the conversation using the hashtag NTVWild on Twitter or on our Facebook page, NTVWild. Now, last week, we spoke about Japan's ivory secret here on NTV Wild Talk. Today, it's about China, and it really is no secret that China is, in fact, the biggest market for ivory consumption. But there is so much more to learn about what's being done to address that. And joining me now here at Fairmont the Norfolk is Hong Xiang Huang, the CEO and founder of China House and also an investigator into the ivory trade. Thank you so much for joining us, Hong. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Now, when a lot of people think about China and the Chinese, they tend to link them to development, to the SGR, to infrastructure, but also to ivory, the deadly ivory trade that is killing off populations of our African elephants. Is it fair that many people think that way and create that connection? Well, on one hand, I think it's reasonable that people have that impression because I would not deny that China is one of the biggest ivory market today. But at the other, on the other hand, I think it's not fair because in China, there's less than 0.1% of Chinese who would be buying those ivory products. It's just because China is such a big population of country. So even 0.1% of people is already a large market. But there are other Chinese who are against the ivory trade. There are Chinese who are fighting hard to stop the ivory trade as well. Well, 0.1% seems like such a small amount, as you said, uh, yet China is the biggest market. So who then are these people that are buying ivory? I have many like, non-Chinese friends who always ask me this question, so why you Chinese love ivory? Why you want to buy ivory? My answer to that is always, so tell me why people buy diamond? It's something useless, but it's a status of symbol. And as China is getting richer and richer, they are some part of Chinese people. They would buy all kinds of things for status of symbol, from luxury bags, from like luxury cars, and some of them would be buying ivory. But again, still, that's a very small portion of Chinese people. So would you say it is perhaps the, the, the richer Chinese people that want to feel that they have um, a higher status in society? Yeah, of course. In general, I think that is true for all the countries as they develop. There would be some kind of rich people. They are buying all these luxury products from everywhere. And ivory is one of them. So 
Ivory can, of course, be very expensive, and that's why it is a, a, a symbol of a high status. Yes. So are you essentially saying that your average common man on the street that you might see in China or even here in Kenya, because you see so many Chinese yes. people now, they are not the ideal ivory buyer? Well, it depends. So even the, no matter the Chinese in China or the Chinese here, as I said, there will be some people who will be the buyer of ivory. And actually, uh, as ivory, to buy ivory is not that expensive in Africa. So the people who may consume ivory here in Africa may not be really rich Chinese people mm -hmm. because it's not that expensive here. Over here. Yes. But however, this, uh, at the same time, all the Chinese people I know here, I know in China, there are many most of them haven't even seen ivory. A lot of them they don't even know you can buy ivory in China because we do wildlife conservation program. So a lot of the time when we're talking to people about ivory and they say, really, we can buy ivory in China? What is ivory? So a lot of people don't even know what ivory is. A lot of people don't is. even know what it is. And a lot of people don't have never considered buying it. And even for me, I'm an investigator. Today I would say I'm one of the experts on the ivory trade. But before I started this investigation, in all my about 20, 25 years of life in China. I have never ever seen ivory. Wow. I have never ever heard about people buying ivory or I have never heard about like the existence of ivory shops. Really? So it really is a, a, a clique, um, yes. a certain sort of segment of society yes. that invests in ivory. Yes. Let me ask you, Huang, uh, Hong, do, do the people that buy ivory know that that means an elephant or populations of elephants in Africa or elsewhere are being killed? Uh, I would say some know and some don't. Because in China, there was one time, it's very interesting, I was doing a talk in China to tell people more about elephants and so on, and there was one girl who stood up and said, oh, you know what, I also have a piece of ivory, but it's from dead elephants. At the moment, I was like, um, unfortunately, that may not be true. Yeah. So then I told her all these things about this. So there are many Chinese people who don't know how ivory is from. They may know it's from elephants, but they may think this is from dead elephants or like overpopulated elephants as some of the traders would promote. But there are also some Chinese people who know it's from, it's, it's, it's from dead elephants and they still buy it. Elephants that have been poached. Yes. Right. And they just don't care. And they don't care. Yeah, they right. are all kind of different people exist. Of course, of yes. course. Um, it's interesting to know that there is that perception in China that some people think that actually uh, the bracelet or the necklace that's made of ivory that they buy is from an elephant that has died out of natural causes, yes. like you say. Or I, I believe there is um, a myth that some people think um, it's a donation from the dead elephant that, you know, here are my oh, they are, they are. Especially by the traders. The traders, when they are trying to sell ivory, and especially when, because in China now, there's are strong promotion campaign that is against the illegal trade. So when the traders are still they want to sell, they will say, oh, you know what, our, our ivory is fine. Their ivory is not good, but buy our ivory. Really? So, That's so what businessmen would do. Of course. And they would twist the conversation. And the problem is, right now, China and Africa, there's a huge communication gap between these two countries and the people. So a lot of the time, the Chinese people don't understand what's the situation in Africa, as the Africans do not understand what's the situation in China. What's being done in China to, to fix that problem? Is anything being done in the first place? Because, Hong, you know, over here in Kenya, uh, there is so much publicity about, you know, stop the ivory trade. Everybody knows about it. But what's happening in China? In China, in the recent years, what I have seen is in, all, in a lot of the subway airport, there are a lot of campaigns being done by organizations such as I4, YOA, all kind of organizations. So you can see a lot of advertisement with the famous celebrities saying no to ivory. So nowadays, I would say the awareness of Chinese people about ivory trade is going from here to here. Mm -hmm. And even on those like social media and those like Chinese news channel, you more and more get to hear the stories about elephant and ivory trade. For example, the death of Satao. Yes. That was a very famous news in China, so really? people get to know about it. And also the arrest of Ivory Queen in Tanzania mm -hmm. and all these things. In the past few years, I would say the awareness now in China is already quite high. Okay, and is that thanks to uh, various NGOs or is it thanks to the government? Because governments play key roles. Is the government in China acting? 
I would say it's a combination effort of both government and NGO. NGO, they are doing a lot and their works are usually more visible. That's why a lot of people will think the NGO does more. Mm -hmm. But actually, based on my understanding and knowledge, the government actually does more. Because it's the government who manages the law, the government who does the enforcement, and the government who arrest the people. But as we all know, government may not be very good at communication, at of speaking, course. like all the government. And some government may be worse than others mm -hmm. in terms of like having doing your promotion. Yes. But it doesn't mean they're not doing the work. In China, I just have, I have just met some of NGO people and I told them about the investigation that was recently done like last year. Mm -hmm. And she told me, oh, you know what, those people may already be arrested because we are working with the policemen and so on. They have been arresting so many people. So I, I wanted to come to that. How have there been major arrests of big kingpins in China? Uh, clearly you're saying that arrests have been made. I think the arrests have been made, but I'm afraid I'm not a very good person to comment on this mm -hmm. because all my work is usually done in Africa oh. and Southeast Asia. Okay. So I actually haven't done any kind of like investigation or something inside China. Mm -hmm. so well, I'm speaking of that, I mean, you've done a lot of investigation here in Kenya. But before we get to that, uh, Hong, you're a Chinese young man living here in Kenya. You know, you've started up this NGO called China House, which we'll find out more about in just a moment. But what brought you here to Kenya? So this, start, this story started from 2011 when I was still doing my master degree in Columbia University on international development. So I got some chance to go to Latin America to do some studies about the Chinese overseas investment there and the social environmental conflicts, labor issues, like wildlife issues, pollution, all these kind of things. And since then, I got very interested in this topic. And I see a huge gap between the China, the Chinese people that are in developing countries and the, all, the whole outside world. Mm -hmm. And so I always wanted to break to help bridge the gap. And in 2013, I got a fellowship to go to South Africa for something called the China Africa Reporting Project. As a journalist fellow, I spent three months doing undercover investigation in South Africa, Mozambique, and Namibia on ivory trade and rhino horn trade. Really? It, I, from there, I realized something very interesting. For me, with a Chinese face, based on the communication gap, it's really easy for me to do investigation. I just need to go to the market. I can just take out my phone and take pictures of the traffickers and the ivory. It's fine. You pretend to be an interested I don't party. even need to pretend anything because they all assume Chinese must be ivory buyers. Mm. How can any Chinese be an investigator or policeman mm. or journalist? Mm. Because they just haven't encountered people like this. So because of this advantage, later on from this South Africa experience, I worked with many conservation organizations such as the Eagle Network, the Elephant Action League and so on. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of undercover investigation in different countries, not only in Kenya, but in Uganda, in Malawi, in Vietnam and so on. And I think now I'm one of the few Chinese who have this kind of intensive investigation experience. So Hong, what were some of your findings uh, while you investigated in all these countries, particularly here in Kenya? Actually, all my knowledge about the ivory trade and rhino horn trade is from my investigation mostly. Because during my investigation, I get to interact with a lot of the people, no matter the local traffickers or the Chinese communities, who, among whom some of them are involved with the trade. So I get to understand, so who are the Chinese people in Africa and how are they one group different from each other? You have the state company people, you have the private company people, you have the small, small business people, their background, their behavior are all different. And I get to understand in what kind of circumstance can Chinese people be involved in the ivory trade and what role would they be playing? For example, they will never be poachers. So don't worry when you see Chinese in Masamara. Yeah. Chinese never do the poaching themselves. It's usually the Africans who does that. And all also, I get to understand what are their mindset, how to influence them for them to be part of the wildlife conservation. Because before we get in touch with these people, you may think these are criminals, they're really bad people. But to tell you the truth, when you interact with them, you will find they are just normal people like us. Really? To a lot of these people, some people may think like doing investigation is very dangerous. But to be honest, when I'm interacting with these kind of people, I don't think they are like those kind of mafias like the gun traffickers or like drug traffickers. They are businessmen who do some good things and some bad things. And they may be very nice to you, while at the same time they could be doing something bad that they may not even be aware of. 
So from this experience, that's how we develop the China House work today about engaging the Chinese community. Right, and we'll come to that in just a moment. But Hong, why do these Chinese men, I presume, I'm assuming most of them are men, or all of them are men, are some of them women that some get involved really and with the Ivory it could be young trade? people, it could be old people, so not necessarily old people as well. Right. And it could not, it, sometimes it's not the rich people, as people imagine, it could be normal people just like us. Who are the ivory traders and dealers? Well, not necessarily traders. There are different kind of involvement. There are some people who may be just buying it as a souvenir. You can't call it a trader. Right. They are buyers. But you also have some people who are doing it as a business, like a professional smuggler. So they both exist. So why why do they get involved? Is it I mean, is it purely um, or partly business? I mean, just like like your average, you know, um, buying and selling of any sort of product. For the buyers who are more like souvenir buying people, for them, ivory is just like the black wood or the sculpture. It's just like a souvenir. They just don't see it too much different than the other things. It's all because of the communication gap and so on. And for the smugglers, they are of course aware about the situation, yeah. but they still do it because they want money. Just like what any illegal businessman would do. Right, but, but they choose to get involved in the ivory trade. Well, a lot of the time, they actually, ivory is, would not be the only thing they do. If they are illegal businessmen, they could be doing several things at it the same time. And ivory would be just part of it. Wow, it's, it's so, so interesting, Hong. And tell me, you know, when, um, when you did these investigations, at any point, did you try and then speak to these men and women and fix the situation in any way or try create that awareness? Of course, not with the smugglers, of course, yeah. but with the souvenir kind of buyer, we, I will actually bring up this ev eventually and talk with them because I want to understand yeah. how they think about this. Yeah. And what I realize is after you showing them, for example, you're telling them this is from dead elephants may not be enough. Mm -hmm. But after, for example, you have shown them the picture of dead elephants and so on, they say, wow, I didn't know this is cool. And in my personal experience, I have known many, many Chinese people who used to buy ivory but don't do this anymore. Those people could be changed and could be engaged if we engage them in the right, right way. Right. The problem is for a long time, Chinese people have not been engaged in the right way. To tell you the truth, when I first came to Kenya in 2013, when I attend all the conservation activities, I see no Chinese. The communication gap is not only the fault of the Chinese people, but also the lack of effort from the local side to reach out to them and understand them. And I just could not understand, how can you talk about ivory and protecting elephants without engaging the Chinese people? That's so true. That is so true. And that brings me to another question. You know, the link between um, our government and the Chinese government is, is very strong. Um, trade is, is key. And of course, we have a big Chinese population here that are helping build the railway and um, roads as well. Are you aware of engagement between our president and um, the government in China? Does our president speak to the Chinese to try and improve that uh, communication? First, I want to say the China-Kenyan government relations, I think, is very strong. And in fact, I'm not sure whether the public are aware of or not, but the Chinese government has donated many vehicles to KWS and so on, and equipment and so on. It's just like, because as I said, government may not be that good in promotion, so less people know about it. And definitely, the both sides, the government is doing good. However, in my opinion, government is not enough. Civil society is very important. And the lack of Chinese civil society participate in this conversation is what is creating the problem. You know, for the government, there are many restrictions for them. Yes. They may not be like me. They cannot just come and talk in front of the TV because like, I could say something stupid. And I can't afford to be saying something stupid. If you're part of the cannot. government, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there are many restrictions facing the government. That's why we need civil societies, NGO, media to participate as well. All right, and Hong, we're about to get into that discussion, but we've got to take a break first. Okay, um, we will continue this very interesting conversation about what's happening in China and how really things are changing. This is NTV Wild Talk. Remember, the hashtag is NTV Wild on Twitter, or you can like like our NTV uh, Wild Facebook page. We're coming to you from the grounds here at Fairmont, the Norfolk that are accommodating us for this conversation. It's time for a breather, but first, your favorite part, it's time for our Wild Guess question. What percentage of China's population buys ivory? What percentage of China's population buys ivory?
Remember, our Wild Guess entry rules have changed. Now, to participate, you must like the NTV Wild Facebook page and post your answer on the timeline associated with this question. Answers sent via Twitter will unfortunately no longer be considered. The first person to answer correctly wins two nights for two at the luxurious Fairmont Mara Safari Club in the Maasai Mara. The winner also gets one bottle of wine courtesy of Wines of the World and a gift hamper courtesy of Wildlife Direct. Terms and conditions apply which can be found on the NTV Wild Facebook page. Last week's lucky winner was Elizabeth Mwangi. Welcome back to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi, coming to you from Fairmont, the Norfolk, here in Nairobi. Here's a reminder of our wild guess question. What percentage of China's population buys ivory? What percentage of China's population buys ivory? Remember, our Wild Guess entry rules have changed. Now, to participate, you must like the NTV Wild Facebook page and post your answer on the timeline associated with this question. Answers sent via Twitter will unfortunately no longer be considered. The first person to answer correctly wins two nights for two at the luxurious Fairmont Mara Safari Club in the Maasai Mara. The winner also gets one bottle of wine courtesy of Wines of the World and a gift hamper courtesy of Wildlife Direct. Terms and conditions apply which can be found on the NTV Wild Facebook page. Last week's lucky winner was Elizabeth Mwangi. So my conversation with Hong now continues. Hong, as I said earlier, you are the founder of an NGO called China House. Tell us more about it. What, what is China House all about? So essentially, during my research and reporting and so on, I saw the huge gap between the Chinese and the world in Africa, in Latin America and so on. And the lack of Chinese NGO here in Africa or in Latin America. So my thought was that could we start a group of young Chinese people who at one hand understand the Chinese people and can talk to the Chinese people, but at the same time can understand the West and the NGO and all these media and so on. So what we did is simply, so at that time there's a friend of mine who follow us a house, that's why it's called China House. Right. And then on through internet, we recruit young Chinese volunteers from China, from US, from UK. We ask them, would you be interested in come and join us and to understand more about the Chinese in Africa and to help promote the sustainable development of Chinese in Africa. So that's how it started. It's like a group of young Chinese volunteers trying to see what can we do. So what we, we do several things. We do a lot of research with international NGO to better understand Chinese companies here and the sustainable development. And on wildlife conservation, we work with a lot of international NGOs such as Humane Society International, WWF, African Network for Animal Welfare and so on. What we do, so first, our focus is not Chinese in China. There are better organizations doing better works there. Right. There's no need for us to do anything there. Our niche is the Chinese communities in Africa, which Chinese organization in China or non-Chinese organizations in Africa won't be able to really engage. Right. So what we do is we create activities to engage Chinese people to participate. For example, we work with ANO. We realize they have a desnaring activity in, around Naivasha where volunteers go and take off the snares that is set by the, 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 the traffickers to catch zebras and so on. We let the Chinese communities know about this and we invite them to join and do this volunteering. And also, similarly, we bring them to the orphanage of animals and so on to do clean up and so on. And other than wildlife activities, we also try to create a series of orientation 
of training for Chinese companies about, for example, labor law, about tax, about how to communicate with media and so on. Right. And we take these opportunities as a chance to influence the Chinese because we know there are some Chinese who may just not as interested in wildlife as other people. <laughs> right. So they won't come for wildlife activities. Yeah, well, I'll talk about um, the wildlife activities in just a moment. but. How would you define the relationship between the Chinese here in Kenya and the locals in Kenya? Because some people view it as there being a disconnect between the two and perhaps there's a hostile relationship between the two. What do you have to say about that? I would say it's totally, it's very, very serious isolation of Chinese right. communities. And which means the Chinese people, despite that some of the Chinese may live here for a long time, it doesn't necessarily mean they understand the situation. And then interact with local people enough. They are, I think the missing of like channel is the key for this kind of situation. That's why it, it influenced many, many things relatively. For example, we know recently we have the labor issues. And the truth is that based on our research, a lot of Chinese companies, they don't even understand the labor law well. It's not like they want to exploit the laborers. Obeying the labor law is also economically beneficial to them. They just don't know, don't know it. So really, ultimately, a lot of these issues that um, are being caused is due to a lack of communication and yes. understanding. So at China House, you're trying to improve on that. Talk to us more about the Chinese and conservation, because when you put those two words together, one might think, hmm, really, Chinese and conservation? Um, that doesn't happen very often, but clearly it does. Yes. It's, that is why in Africa, in most of the countries I have been to, including South Africa, where you have a huge population of Chinese, you ask the community, have you participated in conservation activities? They say no, and they don't know who are these NGOs, what are they doing? But once we create a channel for them, for example, like the Disneyland, many Chinese are very eager to join. And they join, and when they see zebras, they are hurt, they are injured, they really cry. We have some video documenting all these kind of things. It's what people would not have imagined. They don't know Chinese poten potentially could be engaged in such strong way. We have many Chinese people who, are, who after they understand the situation, they become really angry at the poachers and also like at the Chinese fellow man who would be buying ivory. We have one Chinese kid. Oh, that story is fabulous. A Chinese kid, she, he, she came to Kenya because we offered this opportunity to young Chinese to come here to learn conservation and so on. The day she came, later on she told us, her father asked her, hey, since you are coming back from Africa, bring me some ivory. Despite the fact that the kid is coming here to learn about conservation. And at the end of the trip, after 10 days, after seeing all the things here and so on, she come to me and say, teacher, do you know, like I tell you a secret, my father actually asked me to buy some ivory. Now I know how wrong this is. After I go back, I'm going to teach my father, you should never do this again. It's so bad. The people, they can be engaged if we find a way. Right, so I mean, a story like that really is amazing. It just goes to show that uh, mindsets are changing so long as people are being exposed to what's really, really happening. Um, you know, when you uh, go out there and, and have your campaigns or workshops, um, what kind of a reaction otherwise do you get from people when you show them perhaps photos of these elephants that have been slaughtered? Because when we had this conversation with Ari Yamawaki from Japan last week on NTV Wild Talk, she said that in Japan that sort of approach didn't quite work because when people looked at dead elephants, um, they, they, they turned a blind eye to it. It was too much for them to bear. But how is this approach uh, changing hearts and minds in China? Well, I would say because I'm not sure about Japan, I'm not an expert on that, but a lot of the reason when the, why the Chinese buy ivory is they don't know how cruel it is. Yeah. So when we present the fact to them, although of, of course a lot of the time they may just do not want to see it anymore, but even they have only seen it for one eye, they would, this impression would, would strongly have in their mind and they would be influenced. You know, um, conservation activities are all over the place here in Kenya. And as I said, when one thinks about those two words, Chinese and conservation, it's difficult to put the two together. But um, generally, um, do Chinese people conserve? Do they consider uh, wildlife, um, you know, very valuable, living wildlife, that is, and, and, and nature as well, as, as we do here in Kenya? Well. There's no statistics, so I cannot say about the ratio. But, but I would say there are some Chinese who are not interested in wildlife at all. 
they are. There are some Chinese who think like human beings are more important than wildlife, so they care more about children, like baby, yeah. uh, children, uh, women, and so on. Yes. And some of the Chinese, they will be very passionate about wildlife as well. For example, I have a friend whose name he named himself after Simba, oh, like the really? lion. Oh. <laughs> he used to be a government official in China, but he quit his job and come to Kenya and started the first. Wildlife, Chinese wildlife conservation NGO in Africa. In Africa, it's called Mara Conservation Fund, which I'm part of the board member. So you have people passionate like this. So there are many people. There's just too many Chinese people. And Hong, you know, when Kenya made the decision to burn tons and tons of ivory, how was this received in China? Because those people who, who trade and buy ivory must have been thinking, oh no, what is Kenya doing? Um, so tell us more about that. Well, the fact that like people are more and more aware about the ivory trade and so on, I believe it's making a very good impact in the Chinese ivory market. I believe the market is going down, but again, I'm not an expert on that. But in terms of the ivory burning, what I can see is two types of reaction. The one type of reaction, people are saying, oh, it's a shame, they're so beautiful. Since they are, the elephants are dead already, you should just keep it. Yeah. And there are other people who say, oh, it's great, we should just burn this all. And Based on my knowledge, it's not only this is not something special with the Chinese, it's also international. Of course, yes. Well, we certainly hope that the message that Kenya wanted to spread, you know, has, has, has been spread. And, yes. um, you know, when we talk about um, ivory yes. um, and elephants, uh, we also think about uh, functions such as CITES, which is coming up uh, later this year. Do you know about China's position when it comes to CITES? I'm not an expert on CITES, but what I have known is usually international activities like such is also usually quite disconnected with the normal Chinese people. That's why around CITES, we are, our team is going to head to South Africa and trying to do similar programs that we are doing here to engage the Chinese communities there in Johannesburg, in Cape Town and so on, to let them more aware about the situation, about CITES, what is CITES, what CITES want to do, what is CITES related to us, mm -hmm. and then through them, they can be a very good platform for us to spread this information to all the Chinese in China. Right. Hong, earlier you spoke about, uh, very briefly, the Ivory Queen, and she certainly was, you know, a woman that traded intensely in ivory, and she was uh, caught and arrested in Tanzania. Why do you think it took so long for that capture to happen? Well, I think in terms of why it takes so long to capture any criminals, actually I know, based on my knowledge, last year in Tanzania, other than the Ivory Queen, there was also a very huge local Tanzania trafficker whose nickname is called Devil. He was also arrested and actually that news and the scare is much more than the Ivory Queen. And so uh, back to the question why it takes long for the criminals to be arrested, I think it's related unfortunately to corruption, inefficiency of governance and so on. So maybe because the new government is just more strong on these issues. Yeah. And also I believe it's related to many like NGOs getting involved and so on and trying to help. Clearly from what you're saying, um, there is improvements, particularly in China. You're, you're confident of that. You can yes. say that confidently. Yes. All right. Well, still, of course, more needs to be done. And what is that more? Well, from my personal perspective, I would say there are two types of things that could be done more. One is on investigation side, one is on awareness raising side. In investigation, what I can see is if you bring in some Chinese people like myself as investigator, you can break through many things that other people have failed to do so because the traffickers are just so not used to this kind of new type of generation yeah. investigators. So that can help a lot in terms of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. On the other side is the community engagement. So if we engage the Chinese community more in Africa, it's going to be very significantly helpful. In my view, Chinese in Africa is one of the most important people in the whole global ivory trade mm -hmm. because several reasons. One, the ivory from Africa to China, Chinese in Africa would be an important link to that. Mm -hmm. Second, compared to Chinese in China who may never have seen an elephant. Mm -hmm. Chinese in China, they have chance to, be, to see an elephant, to see the wildlife. So potentially they can be engaged much more. Mm -hmm. And lastly, the Chinese people here, they feel the impacts. For example, they see the media, oh again, Chinese arrested, so bad image to us. And they see, I have some Chinese friends who told me they once ran into a lady, a local lady, who just ran to them and say, I will kill your panda because you kill our elephants. This is what the Chinese people in China would not see, would not feel, but the Chinese people in Africa, they could feel.
So once we engage these communities, these people can help the Chinese in China understand more about Africa because they are the communication bridge. And also, once they become part of the conservation fighters, they can do a lot of whistleblowing and so on, which can help a lot. It can be a game-changing thing. Yeah, most definitely. You know, Hong, you talked about uh, what the government's role is, yes. what NGOs' role is, but what about the common man and woman? Who, who are the Chinese elephant heroes? There are many Chinese normal people who are playing a big role here. We have seen some young Chinese who come here to write stories about the wildlife NGOs so that the Chinese people are more aware about who they are. Are they really attacking China using ivory as a tool or they just have a lot of misunderstanding? We have some young Chinese who we have seen participate in the investigation of myself and they risk their life to arrest the traffickers. We have seen Chinese businessmen here in Kenya. They have been just spreading their news in, on their social media. Hey, there are some more Chinese arrested. This you should never do it. Like, if you come to Kenya, please, please don't buy ivory. Those are the everyday heroes that the people may not know. So there really is so much that still needs to be done, Hong. Um, but let's go back to China House for a moment. What are some of your upcoming projects? We have one annual big project coming soon. It's called the Wild Run. So at the end of August, August 28th, we are planning a run in the Gong Forest, which we want to bring Chinese people and Africans and Westerners, all kind of people together to run and they would be covered by colorful powder. Why we use colorful powder is like, I think color is a symbol of different people coming together. No matter you're Africans, you're Chinese, you're Westerners, no matter you're human beings, you're giraffe, you're elephants, we just come together for the same goal. So people will come and run together, use this chance to interact with each other, to understand each other. And also at the end, they will sign a big pledging. We are here together against the illegal trade. And this event then that is the goal we want to, the, the message we want to send, especially right before CITES. So that is the 28th of August. So yes. if anybody wants to join in that run, no doubt it'll be fun and very colorful as well. So you can just get in touch with us and we will connect you to China House. Definitely something fun coming up at the end of August. Hong, um, you know, personally for you, um, what do you in your heart feel about the African elephant and conservation as a whole? Because you've dedicated your time to uh, educating others, what does it mean to you? Well, to be honest, I'm, I would even call myself a, like extreme environmentalist because I'm just so crazy about animals. The moment you see me look, finding a, looking at the animal, you, you will realize that. I just can't stop my passion of loving animals. And that's why in all this topic, like, you know, China House, we're doing more China-Africa facilitation, but wildlife conservation would be one of the big part. It's just because personally, I just a crazy <laughs> right. fan of elephants. And, and Hong, what do you hope that Kenyans who are watching this, uh, what do you hope their perceptions of Chinese people will now be? I hope the Kenyans, well actually I would say the Africans and all the people in the world, just try to put down your bias. There are some Chinese who are bad people, of course, like any of those countries. Right. But there are many Chinese who are good people, so you should just be open and try to see the people in front of you could be different than what you have thought. That's the only wish I have. Of course, so really be open-minded and don't stereotype. If you see a Chinese person, don't automatically uh, connect them with, with ivory because especially here in Kenya, it's probably the opposite. They're probably doing something good here in, in Kenya. Um, what's your uh, hope for the future? Do you feel optimistic that indeed things will improve even more when it comes to uh, the population of the African elephant and the illegal trade in ivory. Because in the past one, two years, I have been seeing more and more engagement from the Chinese part. And I believe that is going to be a key. Because if China is part of the problem, China needs to be the solution. And as more Chinese are participating, because for example, like now in Kenya, you will find no Chinese who are doing ivory stuff at all. But a few years ago, they may be. It's all because of the awareness and so on. And this participation, I believe, is going to be a significant change to the whole situation. All right, Hong, thank you so much for joining us on NTV Wild Talk and for providing that crucial insight into the Chinese here in Kenya, the ones in China, and that link with the ivory trade, but also uh, the attitudes that are changing. Much appreciated. Thank you. 
All right, with me is Hong, the founder of China House, who's also an investigator into the ivory trade. He is based right here in Kenya. This is NTV Wild Talk. It's time to shift focus from that conversation now to our Wild Pick segment. Photos that you sent in that demonstrate you love nature and the environment. Here they are. Duncan Mashani was at the Thompson Falls in Nyahururu posing in front of the falls and had said he had gone there just to simply feel the cool breeze emitted from the falls. At the Hippo Point camp in Naivasha, this is Josphat Wandiga. He was posing by Lake Naivasha and simply enjoying nature, he says. On Mount Kenya's third highest peak, Lenana, this is Ibrahim Kariuki. He says he was taking a break from climbing and he's a mountain guide on Mount Kenya. David Kilonzo was at the Lukenya Hills. He had gone on a nature walk with friends and says they did so because they love nature, they did poetry in the wild and also planted trees. And this is Linda Tunoy. She was at the Mount Kenya National Park on a mountain climbing excursion and she was there to appreciate nature. If you want your photo showcased on our Wild Pick segment, just like our NTV Wild Facebook page and send a photo that shows you celebrating nature via private message. Include your full name, tell us where the photo was taken, what you were doing and why. And now here's what's coming up on the NTV Wild documentary series on Saturday night. Throughout the series, we've been able to keep track of our cats day and night. Using infrared lights, cameras and viewing equipment, we've been able to watch absolutely natural behaviour in complete darkness. And it's not just the cats we've been seeing. An extraordinary range of creatures are out and about during the hours of darkness, providing us with rarely seen moments from the African night. It's far from a simple task. Driving by infrared light makes spotting deep mud holes challenging in the extreme. But the unique view this approach provides makes it worthwhile. Well, I certainly hope that conversation with Hong has provided you with more perspective and insight. Yes, China is still the biggest consumer of ivory, but things are slowly but surely improving. Now, here's a couple of things for you to remember. On the 28th of August, you can get involved with the Wild Run organized by China House, an opportunity for you to get involved in some conservation. And also on the 27th and 28th, there is the TICAD conference. That is the Tokyo International Conference for African Development. Now, that is to do with Japan, but it's very important because it is an opportunity for our president to speak to the government of Japan to improve on the ivory situation there. Because remember, it's not just China. Japan, too, is involved in ivory. That's where we leave it on NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. Thank you very much for watching. We're coming to you from Fairmont, the Norfolk, here in Nairobi. We'll see you again Tuesday, 10 p.m. You want to see something good, you want to take me to the house. Yeah, that's a good idea. And then when we walk there and then... Yeah, that's a good idea. From the quaint gardens of Fairmont, the Norfolk. Today, the focus of... Don't find... Just when... No, when I've done 15... Just tell me five, so I know five minutes left. China and conservation and... Hallelujah! That was one take! No, 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 no. I'm good. <laughs> and then... <laughs> oh, you're still filming me. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. Never mind. NTV Wild Talk in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct.